I'd like to call the December 16, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board to order. The Board will be considering tonight's agenda in the following order. Approval of the minutes from the November 18th Planning Board meeting, followed by the Ramshead Boardwalk Resource Protection Permit, then the Planning Board Rules of Procedure Amendments, Land Use Amendments Status Report, then public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, followed by adjournment. I just want to also mention that there was um, an item on the agenda for tonight. It was the um, 1200 Shore Road private access way, and it has re been removed due to incompleteness. So the first item was approval of the minutes. Anyone have any comments, questions on the minutes? No? Then would anyone like to make a motion on the minutes? I will. Thank you, Peter. Move to approve the minutes. Second. Thank you, Peter. OK. Any discussion? All those in favor? OK, that was unanimous. All right, next item on the agenda, the Ramshead Boardwalk Resource Protection Permit. <coughs> Ramshead Partners is requesting a resource protection permit to construct a 2,046 linear which is 6,138 square feet of a three-foot wide elevated wooden boardwalk including a 34 linear foot, which is 102 square feet, aluminum bridge in an area of RP1 wetland and sand dune located at 20 Ramshead Road. A public hearing has been scheduled for this evening, and the application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-8-3, Resource Protection Regulations. This item will be addressed in the following format. The town planner will provide an overview of the item, after which the applicant will summarize the project. The public is welcome, as part of the public hearing, to comment on this project, after which the board may begin discussions. And then we will conclude with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, an overview, please. Sure. Just to remind the board that um, this uh, project is in a smorgasbord of resource protection, sand dune, RP1 wetland area. A uh, portion of it's also in the 100-year floodplain, so it has already received a, uh, a long list of permits from the state, and you have a record of those. Uh, the planning board's focus is purely for a resource protection permit because of its location, and the only recommendation you're getting from staff, I believe, is that at some point Oops. before construction, there will need to be a flood permit. Um, with that, I'm... I'm going to turn it back over. Yeah, okay, to sure. <laughs> yes, all right. Stephen, <laughs> would you like to um, provide us with a summary for yes. Let me know how long you've had an injury, it appears. So let yes. me know how long you are able to stand at the podium if you need to sit. It will be brief. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, good evening. Stephen Moore here on behalf of Ramshead Partners. Yes, please. Um, I think between the packets, between our site walk and all the information we've been through. Everyone has a pretty good understanding of this project. 2,000, a little more than 2,000 linear feet of boardwalk and the 34-foot bridge. Um, we do have the DEP and Army Corps permits for the nine square feet of wetland impact. We do have the DEP permit for sand dunes for construction in a natural resource habitat and for um, the wetland and the sand dune permits. So we have those in place. You have the Department of Conservation comments wherein they didn't identify any deficiencies or issues with this. Steve Harding through AMEC has reviewed the package and found that it conforms with his notes. The revised plan that we submitted to you included the three critical things which were an indication of the timing of activities which have to happen between September and April. The uh, need for all that work to occur without mechanical equipment in that resource. And then the identif identification of the station breaks where phase one and phase two met. So we've included those as notes on the plan that came into you in early December. What we've done is gone through, mapped this out, identified all the issues, we're back before you tonight because we need this final permit from you. With that in hand, we will go see the code enforcement officer to secure the flood permit because our structure sits within that flood hazard zone. We've designed it so it complies with the on the drawing board flood hazard zone from FEMA not yet adapted. 
So we think we're in good shape to move forward. We look to this board for any final guidance or comments. And I really think that's it. We've been thoughtful and careful, and I'll turn it over to the board now for comment. Um, in closing, we did, the whole team looked at that question about that bridge and the flexibility that we talked about in the field during the site walk of moving it. And <coughs> our final conclusion amongst the design team, which included us as the designers, the structural engineers, Albert Frick as our soil scientist, was that in the event that that, in the event that we have soil loss around that bridge, based on our projections, that soil loss is going to be substantial enough that the reach back on the boardwalk redirection, in other words, if we have to move the bridge, we're going to be reaching back a significant distance away from that bridge, and there's no way we can accurately project that. We weren't comfortable asking for that sort of large gray area with this board. So we simply are holding with that bridge. We have, I hate to say this, every reasonable comfort that that's going to stay where it is, but we just, we appreciate that, but we just couldn't see where we'd stop with that realignment. So we didn't include that in this package. Instead, figuring that if it comes apart, we'll be back and we'll talk about that with you again. So with that, I'll turn it back to the board. I do have one question for you, Stephen. Um, when I was reading the package, when you talk about the 2046 linear feet of boardwalk, you're also including the bridge. So when you say boardwalk, it's all, it, that's right, 2046 is the total length, end-to-end, -to -end, including, bridge. yes, exactly. Okay, I just wanted to clarify, it's not and an additional it is not. boardwalk, it's all? Correct. Okay, that was my only question. Anyone have, yes, Henry? Um, it, it, first of all, the comment about the walk, it was very informative, and, um, but I have one question, which you I, use your microphone? Sorry. I have a question which I, I don't know whether it's covered by this or not. I note it's three foot wide and elevated. And it runs through a lot of grass area, or what was described as grass. And I also saw a lot of deer um, markings where they've been walking up and down. Um, it wondered to, kept cross my mind that it was a pretty long path and that I don't think deer can leap three feet and three foot in the air. So that means that the rest of the, of the marshland is cut off from the existing deer unless they've got enough sense to go around the end and come back again. So I, I know it sounds, but, but that's but a wildlife protection pro we've, question. We've actually looked at this. We've oh, actually, we did consider this. And we came back with two thoughts. We do a fair amount of work trying to protect habitat from deer. And what we found is that deer can leap up to a four foot horizontal distance as long as the height is less than four feet. That's sort of option one. So our sense was they probably can clear this. The deer would normally be able to clear that because it's three and it's less than three feet wide. But with that said, because of the deer paths in here, if you notice that, we, we sort of traversed, a good portion of that boardwalk traverses the horizontal deer path. We suspect the deer are just going to learn and move one side or the other. They're either going to migrate on one side or the other. Because yeah, I wondered if you wouldn't put a section of it a little bit lower, like go down to one foot or one foot six, so that they could, they could go over it in one or two places without... We can't under the sand dune regulations. The sand dune regulations from the main department of environmental protection are what required the 36 inch elevation to preserve <laughs> flow and preserve the grass cover under. So I suspect we talked through this with the natural resource people up in gray. We suspect that if they're in flight, the deer will actually just leap over it. Yeah. If they're just moving through and grazing, they're going to follow that. We suspect they're just going to follow that alignment. That's what our, that's what we're projecting. So we don't see that as a cutoff. We see that as they're going to move through that in a way that they would do right. adapting to any other obstacle. All right. Thank you. Does anyone have a question with Stephen before I allow him to sit down? Which, okay. <coughs> two, two minor questions, Steve. Uh, one, I noticed you, your plans call for an uh, observation deck. It looks like a three-foot bump out. Correct. And uh, try as I might, I couldn't find it on the plan. Is it located, or do you plan to put that sort of after you got the thing in? After we get it in, we're going to locate it, but it's suggested in the plans. It indicates that it's in that 
It's on that loop, the loop okay. right in there. I'm pretty good on that lateral motion. And the, the bridge decking is aluminum, not cedar. Just because That's correct. The bridge comes with its own decking. The bridge decking is cedar. Oh. I, must have the I, I believe the plans call it as aluminum, but we were concerned about reflectivity sitting out there in the marsh. So I, the last set of drawings that I redlined, I changed that aluminum. It's still an aluminum bridge, but the decking is cedar. Okay. Uh, I, the one I looked at, I thought I saw that was aluminum decking. That's a good point, Peter. I don't, I'm positive that it's a cedar decking for lessened reflectivity. Anyone else have any other uh, questions or comments just for Stephen before I let him sit down? Steve, we talked a lot about the location of the, um, the, the anchors for the bridge and how many feet back they would be from the edge. And I was trying to find that designated on the plan. And is, are the hash marks here? Are those indications of, of distance? What we have on that one drawing of the, of the aluminum bridge is we've shown the helical anchors, and then we've just called out a dimension to the top of bank. I, I kept reading through it, trying to make sure I could see it. But, uh, I think it's just on that one. On the bridge, bridge cross section? Peter. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> we don't. We don't actually specify that distance back from the top of the on the drawings. I don't know about anyone. I would suggest that, that should be on the plan, even if it's in a note. How many feet back it sets? But I'll look to the rest of the board to see if they agree or disagree. Maureen, any comment from you on the plan? If, if, if board members want it specifically done a certain way, then absolutely you should make it a condition on the approval. Okay. Uh, Carol, you might have this in mind. Maybe you can help make the... Well, I just wonder, I mean, if no one else sees yeah, it as I'll, an issue, then I... I'll, are I'll you worried about the distance that from it's, the... That it's from the edge where they're setting the anchors from the edge of that. Because the bridge is 34 feet long. Mm -hmm. Those anchors can't be too far in from the edge of the bridge. And you're going to want to kind of have equal amounts of distance back from the bank on both sides. You're not going to shove it all the way to one side. Right. I, I have no issue whatsoever adding a note on that detailed drawing three of three. It simply says that the closest point of the helical anchor shall be no closer than four feet from the existing top of bank because that's our prescribed minimum on the south side. Now, you were very specific that you knew where you wanted we, to place We do, it. because we've so. investigated that pretty thoroughly. And as I recall, it was going to be farther on one side than the other. And that is exactly Projected that, more movement on one That's side. exactly right. Yeah. OK. Any other questions for the applicant? No? OK, then. Thank you. Hmm. Now, this is a public hearing, and there is nobody here um, besides ourselves. So. Um, Right, so I'm officially opening it. There's no one here. I'm now we're going to officially close it. All right, does the board have any other discussion? Um, I will point out um, AMAC is fine with the plans. The Conservation Commission had a site walk and they voted six to nothing uh, to recommend the resource protection permit. Um, I, I didn't have any other real comments or questions. Huh? Were they lucky enough to have as nice a day as we were? For our <laughs> they, they didn't have a sidewalk. So. Oh, they didn't. Oh, they didn't. But sorry. I showed them pictures of your wonderful sidewalk. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank Steve for arranging such beautiful weather for our sidewalk. That was a lovely walk. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any comments or questions? No? Then at this time, would anyone like to make a motion? Thank you, Elaine. Motion for the board to consider findings of facts 
Ramstead Partners is requesting a resource protection to this program to construct 2046 linear feet, 6,138 square feet of boardwalk in an area of RP1 wetland and sand dune located at 20 Ramshead Road, which requires review under Section 1983 Resource Protection Regulations. Two, the boardwalk will be located in the 100-year floodplain. Three, the application substantially complies with Section 1983 Resource Protection Permit Regulations. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Ramshead Partners for a Resource Protection Permit to construct 2,046 linear feet, 6,138 square feet of boardwalk in an area of RP1 wetland and sand dune located at 20 Ramshead Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, the bridge shown on the plans um, the notes regarding the bridge shown on the plan shall be amended to provide that the bridge deck planking shall be cedar and that the anchors for the bridge shall be installed not closer than four feet from the existing top of bank. And get my phone back on here. Two, that the applicant obtain a floodplain permit from the code enforcement officer. Second. Thank you, Carol Ann. Any discussion on the motion? Yeah, is that cedar uh, preserved or treated? No, it's not. Okay. Anyone else? Any discussion on the motion? Okay, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. The motion is passed. Thank you. It's a good job we went before your foot went. Planning Board Rules and Regulations. Planning Board is proposing amendments to the rules and regulations to address three areas. The amendments concern procedural votes at workshops, site walk procedures, and research by Planning Board members. Uh, we'll be looking at this one um, in the following format. Um, or if you don't mind providing an overview of those three items, and then public hearing is not required for revisions to the Planning Board Rules and Regulations. However, the public is welcome to come to the podium and comment on proposed revisions. And at the close of public comment, the board will begin discussion in, uh, the amendments, concluding with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, sure, so this is just a, um, trying to pull together a few things that have uh, accumulated over time and addressing an, another item. Uh, several months ago, the board did come up with a, I think it was over a year ago now, uh, rules of how you want to conduct the sidewalk. Uh, those rules have been incorporated into these minutes, excuse me, into these rules and regulations. Um, there was a recommendation from the council a few months ago that the planning board consider amendments to their regulations similar to what the council has done in that they now explicitly allow a procedural vote at a workshop. And the procedural vote can be either to make a determination about a board member's conflict of interest and ability to participate in an item or a decision to schedule an item for a workshop at the following regular meeting. In practice, the board has already been doing these things at workshops, you just haven't been taking a vote on them until a regular meeting. So um, procedurally, you can now take the vote. I don't think it really makes a big difference um, overall. And then the last one is an item that came up just a few months ago about internet research. Um, this is an item where uh, it's just come up in one instance. Uh, where the decision was that the planning board could do its own independent research. However, any research needs to be um, sent to the planner and the planner's responsibility would be to collect that research, 
to make sure all board members get a copy of it, to make sure the applicant in any instance has a copy of it, and also to make sure the public file uh, includes all of that information. Any research done after the planning board package goes out would be distributed to all board members and to the applicant as soon as it's received. Uh, this has been reviewed by our town attorney. Uh, he, uh, let's see, how do I put this? This is not the most conservative way of doing it. However, he feels that it is still a reasonable approach that preserves people's due process rights. So he has seen your, your language, and I have given you just two brief comments on that. So unless there's any questions, I'm going to stop now. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, I would open it once again to the public, and there's no one here. So, uh, bringing it back to the board, there are three items that we're looking at. I'm not sure how many comments and questions you have, but let's just take the first one. The first one is called Procedural Votes at Workshops. Anyone have any comments or questions? Uh, I saw Liza first, and then I'll go with Peter. Yeah, I was, um, I was looking at the language. I didn't think it explicitly talked about the ability to take a procedural vote. I mean, it, it mentioned it almost as an aside when saying um, minutes of the workshop are not required except when a procedural vote is taken. And that language is sort of predicated to saying no vote or decision shall be made. And I was just wondering if we should think about, and I would defer to the attorneys, um, explicitly saying that procedural votes are allowed. It's each five. Yes. Are you um, section three? Yeah. It's underlined in red. The previous sentence. Yeah. Actually, there's a lot of it. Except for a procedural <coughs> vote on the potential conflict of interest or bias of a member or to schedule a public hearing. So I, it seemed like it was sort of narrowing the field of procedural votes to only those matters. Right. Right. Okay. Same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. To only take procedural votes on those matters. Correct. Not to say, okay, great. Anyone have any comment at least to that suggestion? And then, Pete, I did recognize oh, you. No, oh, no, no. Okay, so I believe we're going to sit on that. Peter. This, I think, is a clarification only. Um, it says minutes of the workshop um, are not required except when a procedural vote is taken. As it reads, I took it to mean you had to have minutes for the entire meeting which I'm not sure we intended. What if we just said minutes are not required uh, except that minutes reflecting a procedural vote shall be taken. So the minutes would be simply the statement, the, the words of the vote uh, without any of the details of the workshop, whatever those other activities might have been. But I, I don't know what you intended by your language, Marina. I'm just throwing that out as an idea. Minutes are really an interesting topic and they're getting more and more and more discussion. I can tell you that usually what, usually what I hear from people is that uh, the planning board minutes are much too detailed. Um, now we're starting to hear not about the planning board but about other boards that maybe they're not detailed enough. Um, when I drafted this, it was my expectation, one, that I would have to do the minutes, and two, that the length of the detail would not be even that the portion of the workshop that was the typical stuff you do would be nothing more than a headline that said discuss this, discuss this, discuss that, and that the detail that we typically see would only be for the portion of the workshop where there was a vote. But if you want to go and explicitly talk about that, you can. I, I you know, I'm beginning, I'm continually getting advice that really Legally, all minutes have to do is record votes. So we're already way, way over what legally required to do for minutes. Yeah, I'm a minutes minimalist myself, and I, yeah. if, if, if the practice will be as you describe it, I'm, I'll withdraw my comment. That would, that would be fine. Caroline, I'm sorry. I was just going to add, based on what you just said, Maureen, is it your intent to start? I know you, I know you take down information as the for brief for instructions to yourself, uh, but are you going to start doing minutes for each meeting and, and outlining the topics that are discussed? Or Only if absolutely forced to do so. 
Um, I can tell you un under the right to know law, every, the notes that I'm taking now, it's all public That's record. All public record. Right. And I have on occasion had people ask me what happened at the workshop and I've said you're welcome to um, look at my, my notes and I've actually scanned the handwritten notes and sent them to people. They've looked at them in the office. So um, unless the board really wants to go down that road, I would not be doing it. When I was first hired more than two decades ago, the town actually paid for a secretary to take, take notes at workshops. And that was cut in a budget saving measure. So, you know, I, I, I'm now going to the, whatever I take as notes is what we have. Um, I think you need to, I think we need to up our game a little if you're taking a vote. Yes, I agree there. I saw it later, I saw it. I think Peter makes a good point, just so it's clear that we can do a briefing. And I would suggest we just say, minutes of the workshop are not required except to record any procedural vote. And I know you had a question, and then I want to go back and ask the board about that change in language. Go ahead. Oh, um, it struck me that as we are on recording, wouldn't wouldn't it be just as good to have a voice recorder and press the button when we want to do that and pull the button off, and then it's available for anybody who wants to listen to it, and nobody has to write it down. You remember Richard Nixon? No. Sorry, what? <laughs> Sorry, what did you say? You remember Richard Nixon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you mean, yeah. <laughs> yes, precisely, yeah. <laughs> yes, go ahead. I, I appreciate the sentiment of making of ease of effort, but having had to transcribe a regular tape recorder, it's actually very difficult to hear what people say unless they're sitting in front of um, microphones like this. But do you have to transcribe it? I mean, all it is is necessary public record, which we could put I, onto the web if somebody needed yeah, to look the, at it. The, the purpose of the town, I mean, the town still feels very strongly that there should be minutes that can be posted on the website. So we really haven't gone to the point where we've completely abandoned uh, a written record. With all due respect, voice carries quite well. With all due respect, voice carries quite well over the internet. And it's not very difficult to put the recording on the internet. In fact, if you want to see it, you can actually have the frequencies displayed on the screen. And, and, and with respect, um, when the council decides that that's how they want us to keep records for the public, I'd be happy. Well, to I'm it. only suggesting it at a workshop, not at not at the regular meeting, of course. Just the workshop. If you take a vote, then it would be a, a small, a very small sound snippet, and it wouldn't particularly involve anything complicated. Yeah, I, I appreciate that sentiment. Um, I, I think um, with the change in language that Elaine is offering, uh, it does seem that we can have a very minimal, as um, Peter is also supporting, minimal details at these workshops, except when we get to the procedural vote. Then that should be recorded in more detail. How do people feel about uh, Elaine's uh, change to um, a workshops are not required except to record any procedural vote when taken or something along those lines. What I'm for it, yeah. yeah. For it. Okay, so we are, so the, uh, the intent is there. We get the language now to just to clarify that intent. But everyone's all set on number one then? Okay, and I'm going to move on to the second one was site walk procedures. Um, this would be in section three, conduct of meetings, subsection D, site walks. Anyone have any comments, questions about the proposed change to site walks? I am not seeing anything. Or anyone have any, any questions? So number three is research. This will also be in section six, uh, six procedures, subsection C, research. Anyone have any comments or questions about? Yes, Peter. I had one suggested clarification, um, and it's not anything more because I know Maureen has spent a lot of time in this, and our town council has reviewed it as well. So I, I really think this is a clarification. I want to make sure we're, we understand exactly what the output um, will be for this independent research. And right now, it says the research shall be made available to the planning board and the public and the applicant. 
it doesn't say exactly what it is that's made available. And you could say, well, it's just a reference to it or a synopsis of the research or, you know, you have to print it out in full. And so what I was going to suggest is that we say in the second line after the words planning board, information sufficient to identify and locate the research shall be made available. So it would be definitely a, a, a website reference, if that's what it is, or the, uh, an article in a, a magazine, what have you. But so it's not implied here that we have to do a synopsis of, of what the research said. I know in this, on the um, Rudy's case, the thing that Marine circulated, you actually did in, in several cases have a little blurb about what, what was discussed, and that's fine if, if you want to create it, but I, uh, I'm not sure we ought to require that. It's, we want to let people find the thing and then read it and draw their own conclusions. So I thought that would, um, in the, I thought that was in the spirit of what we're talking about. I'm not sure that the rest of the board agrees. Yes. Would you repeat your words again? Yeah. Information sufficient to identify and locate the research shall be made available. Sounds good. Yeah. Rest of the board. Yeah. Sounds good. It'll look okay. Well, uh, with that, I, I want to talk that for a little bit. So say like somebody... Can you use your microphone? Oh, sure. Say somebody um, found um, an article in a journal that's not online. Would they, you know, cite the volume and, you know, of the journal, but not supply the actual text? And then, I, I mean, it just seems like maybe the text of the research should be provided. Because it could be, if something's not available online, it might be difficult for everybody else to access, including the applicant, is my thought. That's some deep research you're doing if you're actually going to the library or someplace that's not internet-based. But um, I would imagine in the spirit of making sure that everyone has access to what is being seen by a board member, that in that case, where somebody would have to I'm trying to think what other, either a, you would have a reference book in your own private libraries type or you go to a library. I'm just trying to think what document would you have access to that others wouldn't, that you would, you would to make sure everyone could read it, you would have to make a copy of it. Could be a 50 I, I think uh, Peter's suggestion covers the spirit of that and that if you were reading an article that was not available online, you could scan it and send it electronically to the planner, and the planner could then distribute it. And I mean, because you don't know, you, you might be flipping through a magazine that's, that's not online, though that's hard to find, or that you have to pay to read online. And so you've, uh, and scanning and providing it electronically, I think, because it's saying information sufficient to identify and locate. And so, I. You're helping somebody locate it by scanning a document and providing it electronically. So I, I think that that covers it. Yes, Maureen. I, I, I see your point, and I think what we tried to do here is the next sentence says, research conducted shall be provided to the town planner in a form of digital or paper copy, internet address, or other appropriate method. So I do think that you know if it was something um, obscure, exotic, hopefully staff would say, look, I think we need to actually, can you give me a copy and I can make it available. So I think we have to rely on the spirit of this. I think you're right. It's it totally in there. It should, I was reacting to the comment, like, oh, no, the, but it's <laughs> totally covered. Yeah. So you mean travel to the Hawaiian Islands or out of, out of reach <laughs> to do the research? I think if you're going to the Hawaiian Islands to do research, you need to send me two. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that is the spirit. We do want all um, information to be seen and not just, um, I read something and, and then not allow others to read it also. Any other comments about this section? Okay, so uh, Peter's change in language, are we agreeing to include that? I'm seeing some heads. Yeah. Okay, all right then, those are the three sections to go through. Anything else though? that we haven't touched on. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so what I've done much more than research is to send um, Maureen a question that I would like the applicant to answer. 
And I don't know if we need a formal way to do that or if the way we've been doing it works pretty well. But I mean, I, I don't really consider that research. I just consider that giving the applicant a heads up. I understand that the, there were objections made to that. I have yet to find one thing that that was inappropriate about that. And, and I'm more than happy to continue with the same approach we have had. The planning board member is not communicating with other board members. You're going directly through me. I'm providing a question to the applicant to be frank. I do that, I do that often. Well, I will get feedback from whomever and will contact an applicant and say, look, I think you're going to get a question about this. You should be prepared to have information. I've never had anyone be upset about it. They always like the heads up. So I think continuing in that manner is fine. Okay. I agree. Um, I think the questions are great. We, we want questions. And as long as we all hear the answer at the same time and receive that answer. So any other comments about? No. Oh. Okay, then. Um, then we'll go ahead and who does that go now to the council? And there's a motion. Oh, yeah, yes. Thank you. Would you. I would suggest when you, if someone would read the motion, they may want to say as amended. Do I have? Yes. yes. All right, motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that the 2014 planning board rules and regulations amendments as amended be recommended to the town council for consideration. We have a second? Second. Thank you, Carol Ann. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Okay, it will go on to the council. All right. We have one last item on the agenda, and this is our land use amendment status report. Uh, the planning board will provide to the town council a status report on the land use amendment package. Maureen, do you want to summarize that one too? Sure. Um, you know, we're almost there, and it's really exciting. Um, we have a package of amendments. We're missing two pieces. One is our comments from our town attorney, and he told me he'd have those to me by the end of the week. The other is uh, the recommendations or the report from our consultant, and I've spoken to him, and he, he's got most of that done, and I fully expect that to be ready for your January workshop. So we're very close. The last time you sent something to the council, you, uh, made it, you committed to a deadline of getting it done by the end of this month or providing a status report. So. What I'm asking you to do is just to approve forwarding this status report to the town council. Thank you. Anyone on the board have any comments about the status report? No, then um, you take a formal vote on that or, yeah, okay. Uh, someone make a motion to send this to the council? Carol Ann, thank you. Make a motion that we send this memorandum regarding land use amendment status report to the town council. Second. Second. Joe, thank you. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Okay. Um, normally we would take a public comment on anything not on tonight's agenda. Once again, there is no one here. And now um, the last item is adjournment. Would anyone like to make a motion for adjournment? Can I have a question beforehand? Oh, I'm sorry, Henry. Henry. It's just, just Henry, you got to use your microphone. I'm sorry. Sorry. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just a quickie, um, I noticed on all of the recommendations it's the facts provided and I, what happens when a fact is incorrect that's been provided? It, it seems that once or twice something has been said that's not actually factual. It's what the applicant believes to be factual, I'm sure, but in actual fact it's not. So I don't know where we proceed from there. If somebody sitting here has some other knowledge, um, predetermined or what? You know, their mind's predetermined. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. Um, what, I think I brought it up last time. Some, some of these pre pressure treated timbers are, in actual fact, not environmentally friendly. They're, they're not terribly uh, good for the environment, they're not disastrous, but they're not. They're not completely neutral. Yet if you ask some people who I'm sure mean very, very well about it, they will turn around and say, oh, it's environmentally friendly. Now, that's not factual.
So how do you go about that? Because we don't seem to have a recourse over this. Well, I have uh, two comments, and um, then I'm going to throw it to you, Maureen. Oh. Uh, my two comments are, uh, first of all, these are the type of questions that um, we were talking about beforehand that certainly should be uh, brought up to someone, such as in that case, that example, I'm thinking our town engineer. You, you possibly could ask a question. I'm not sure if town engineer will know or not, but those are the type of questions. Certainly bring those up beforehand so someone can answer them. And then my second comment, and I'm... I'll bring it back to you, Henry, is that when we do have a question um, and the applicant is, has a different point of view, we are able to bring in a third party. Um, there is always that opportunity for us to bring in our own experts. But the problem with that is it's when it's given. Um, you know, if, you, if it's an ad hoc, I mean, even this, ty this type of meeting, somebody comes up and applies for something, it's the end of a workshop. It's not occurred to us before because, in theory, we haven't made up our minds or what we've thought about it, but we didn't think about that particular question. You ask the question, just like I asked about the deer jumping over the fence. I mean, I'm sure they, they are capable of doing it, but I don't know that they're capable of jumping four feet and four foot up. Now, I take the applicant's word that, that that's the case, but what happens now if I, if, if, this, just theoretically, find that no, on average, deer can only leap two feet. So you have a, you, the facts given, you have to take. That's the bit that I find difficult, you know, and I think somebody brought that up before at one stage about, they, they always say the facts presented, and um, it's not necessarily factual. The same as the internet is not necessarily factual. It's written a lot of, things on the internet are incorrect. So that's my question. And I think there should be some form of repercussion. I, I don't mean punishment. I mean some sort of way of going backtracking some of these things and deciding that they were or in, were not incorrectly stated. Well, once you grant an approval, you don't get a do-over. So yeah. if, if someone, let's use the deer example. You asked a question, the answer was deer are going to be okay. Um, what you can do as a board member, first of all, in the packet, there was a lot of information provided by the applicant from the state. Um, the state did a heavy duty job, in my opinion, of looking at wildlife habitat impact and granted a permit. So that kind of lends credence to the answer that the applicant provided. Right. Further, the applicant said, we've done this in other places. This is our experience. That's a second piece of information. So they're starting to be not just what the applicant said, but some other, in, other facts that are in evidence that tend to support what the applicant said. But let's say you didn't buy that, um, and you still question whether that's accurate. There's a couple of things you can do. You can say, I want more information. I want to table this application, and I want the applicant to provide more information. You need to convince three of your fellow board members of the, of that that's important. And if you can't, you, you lose, and you have to just live with what you have. Um, if you can convince three of your board members, then you table the application. You say, applicant, uh, wildlife habitat impacts are a key standard of review under the resource protection permit standards, and you need to make sure you're asking for something that's actually related to the standards of review. That always is a good thing. Um, and you can say, you need to come back and bring me information that says that this is not going to be a problem. But you need to be willing to delay the project. But once, once you're ready to approve it, then you either need to let it go or maybe you can even get three of your fellow board members to support some kind of condition. And you know, you can come up with something that the applicant provide a letter from the Department of Conservation that they feel confident this is not going to impact the movement of deer. Or, or it, the condition has to be very specific, it has to be something that um, staff doesn't have to use a lot of interpretation on, because you can't delegate your authority to staff, that would be illegal. You, you can have staff implement a decision you've already made, like you have to get this letter. Um, so that's another option. Or you just let it go. So 
Yes, facts will be brought in evidence all the time, and some of them you'll question, some of them you will let go. The reason that motion says, based on the facts and the materials submitted, is it always seemed to me unfortunate that um, in addition to the information that the applicant submits, there's a great deal of work that the planning board does at the meeting. You ask a lot of questions. You really think about it. You discuss it. You massage the information. And it always seemed unfortunate to me that you weren't able to capture some of that effort in the work, in the motion for approval. So that's why it says, based on the facts and materials submitted. I want to be clear that if there's one comment made during the meeting, and that was something that you really wanted to be part of the approval, you need to make it a condition of approval. You can't just rely on stray comments being made during the meeting that someone promised that they weren't going to cut down that tree. But it does, there's nothing that's on the plan, and there's no note on the approval, and the tree comes down. Well, you're out of luck. I, but I do want to point out that the most recent issue you've looked at, the Rudy's application, the fact that the applicant made an extensive presentation about an anodized aluminum was a key, a key reason that the code officer was willing to consider this being an amendment. And he said, it's not a condition on the approval. And I said, if it's based on the facts and the materials submitted, and there was a ton of facts that were presented at the meeting that we didn't get in paper, but it was really the basis for the board's decision. So I think that phrase in the motion, even recently, has been very important. But yeah, this is your job as a, as a board member. You're going to have to sort through the facts, and you're going to be told things that aren't true, either by mistake or deliberately. Uh, but once you make a vote for approval, you don't get a do-over. OK. Is that Henry? OK. Then um, it is, I'm looking for a motion for adjournment, unless anyone has any other comments. Henry? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. A second? Second. Uh, thank you, and all those in favor, and we are adjourned. Thank you.